Well, praise the Lord, my brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. God is so awesomely good. He's good. He's good. God is good. Amen. Amen. We're looking at the gospel according to Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Overall theme for our Sunday school time these three months uh, was it December, January, and February? To Luke with love. Amen. To Luke with love. What a wonderful um, author Luke is. Word of prayer that we're going to allow our ushers to take their places. Father in heaven, thank you so much for what we've already experienced. Thank, thank you, Father, for, the, for not just the uh, praise team, but the praise team who were really giving you praise. Thank you, Father, from the depths of their heart. Uh, and so we give you glory, honor, and we thank you. We admire you. We adore you. Father, we ask, give the congregation ears to hear, hearts to uh, receive the word of God, and help me, Father, to make it plain enough that we can grasp it and live in ways that are pleasing in your sight. This we ask in Jesus' name, for his sake, amen. Amen, amen. Ushers, you can take your places. And uh, again, uh, and while that's happening, uh, I got a text from, uh, or a phone call from Sister Joyce Davidson yesterday. Uh, she said Ben wasn't doing too bad, and so we thank and praise God for that. But she lost her, who was her sister. And I think that may be a homegoing service at uh, Zion Hill this coming Saturday or something, Friday or Saturday. I, I don't know exactly when it is, but uh, we'll get the information to you by one call or, or other ways. And so want to keep Sister Joyce uh, in prayer, the, uh, the um, family that has lost another loved one. But God is able. God is able. So we're here today to give God all the praise, the honor, and the glory. The reason uh, I, we tell you about to Luke with love, let me go back to Luke chapter 1 real quick here. And I read Luke 1, 1. It says, for as much... Luke 1.1, 1, 1. for as much, now there's no junior church today, am I right? Okay, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Amen. Most surely believed. You know, they're believed. They're most surely believed. Uh, my brothers and sisters, I, I believe the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, 1.1 1, 1 to, to 22 the last verse in the book of Revelation, the word of God is true. The word of God never fails. The word of God is um, something that we can trust because it comes from God. Since it's God's word and God is infallible, then the word of God is infallible. He couldn't do anything less. Amen. The Bible says in verse 2, even as though they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. They were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Luke says, yeah, there were other folks now. You know, there's other people out there beside me and you. They're eyewitnesses and they're ministers of the word. And he says, verse 3, it seemed good to me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's another phrase that's used in the book of Acts. That Luke records it seemed good to, it said, it seemed good to me and the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so if it seems good to us, that's okay, but that's not perfect until the Holy Spirit is verifying that it's good. So he says, it seems good to me also, having had, look here, perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, uh, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know how, excuse me, know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now, if I go just a couple places, I go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And I look and see verse 18. Luke, 4, 8, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And now the first verses 14, 15, and 16 are in Matthew and Mark. And... Um, but when you get to verse 17 and 18, Luke adds this. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
Matthew and Mark the, the, the didn't have that. Luke says, I want to give you some perfect understanding. I know what I'm talking about. So in the call of the disciples, then there are certain things that Matthew and Mark say, but they leave out certain things. And Luke says, but Ma Matthew didn't tell you this. So let me just drop this in, in on you. You go, to the, you go to chapter 5, and uh, you look at the end of 4 and 5, and Luke chapter 5, verse 20, it came to pass, and as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, saw two ships. Now those, that verse, that's information there in uh, Luke 5 is not in Matthew and Mark. Matthew and Mark says he called the disciples, and they followed him. Luke says, let me give you a little more information. <laughs> he says there was a ship, and uh, the people hadn't caught anything. So he gives you information, a more perfect understanding. He says, so what I'm telling you, what you know is true, but I'm going to give you a little more. And so what Luke does in his book, he adds stuff that nobody else has. And that's why I say to Luke with love. Nobody would know, nobody would have heard anything about Anna. It wasn't for Luke. Nobody would know Simeon if it wasn't for Luke. Nobody would know Elizabeth if it wasn't for Luke. See, they don't record that Mary took the trip to see Elizabeth. Nobody would know that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his womb. But Luke tells you. Nobody knows about Zacharias, only Luke. See, Luke shows us a lot of people. Jew, Gentile, black, white, whatever, and he makes unknown people known. So Luke is saying, they're all important. We know you heard about the big shots. <laughs> but let me tell you about the little shots. And that's why I love the story of Anna. Anna was just an elderly woman who was fasting and praying. And Luke said, let me tell you about this woman. And so there's no job too small. There's, there's nothing that we do for the Lord that doesn't count. Then the Bible says it this way, a cup of cold water, cup of water given in his name will never lose this reward. Amen. You, you don't have to be doing big things. It's just be important in the little things, do the little things. So I get to chapter 7, and uh, what I'm doing in chapter 7, let me see, I turn the scriptures here, Luke chapter 7. And um, we're looking at great faith, sovereign compassion, confirmed assurance, and abundant love. Great faith, sovereign compassion, confirmed assurance, and abundant love. Great faith, <laughs> sovereign compassion, confirmed assurance. When John the Baptist got a little shaky, Jesus gave him the word. That's, that's what we need. When you get a little shaky in life, you know, you don't need to see anymore, hear anything. You just need the word of God. The word have I hid in my heart that I sin not against thee. The word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It's the word that quickens us. It's the word that makes us the people of God as the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and applies it to our lives. So in the first 10 verses of Luke, great faith. Great faith. Now, most of us know the situation, so I don't have to read all the scriptures. Amen? We've been through Luke in our Sunday school, and we know it says in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 1, now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, when he heard of Jesus, when he heard about Jesus, when he heard about Jesus, he sent into him the elders of the Jews. He sent the elders of the Jews. He was friendly with the Jews. He's a Gentile soldier commanding a hundred men, but he's friendly with the Jewish nation. And he beseeched the elders that they would come, uh, that he would come. Say, go, go talk to Jesus for me, uh, that he would come and heal his servant. So, and when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loves our nation, and he has built us a synagogue. So then the Bible says Jesus went out toward the house. And so great faith, 
Because Jesus will say in the verse 9, turn to verse 9 of Luke 7, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, the centurion, and turned uh, uh, him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say to you that I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Great faith. Great faith in this case, let me simplify this whole thing. You know what great, great faith is? He heard about Jesus and he acted on it. That's great faith. See, the people in Israel were not believing. They were not trusting. They were not acting and, uh, on it. And so Jesus had to time and time again prove himself. Centurion heard about Jesus, and his servant was sick. He loved his servant, so by faith he acted upon what he heard. That's great faith. Amen. In this case, that's what Jesus is talking about. Same with the Syrophoenician woman. Great faith. Great faith is when you hear. See, faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. And when you hear the word of God and you in faith act on it, that's great faith. That's great faith. A lot of people say, I wish I had more faith. No, what you do is act on what you heard. And when you act on what you heard, you begin to demonstrate great faith. Remember the centurion heard. The others, the Jews, they had heard and seen. And they were, had been, uh, uh, Jesus had been on display in many of their lives, but not this, not this centurion. So great faith. How about Rahab the, uh, the, the harlot? The Bible says she told uh, the spot, we have heard. And she acted on it. Great faith is acting on what, you, you, what you've heard about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Everybody with me? That's what great faith is. It, it's not up here where you, you say, well, I thinking about it. It's not even when you say, I believe it. It's when you act upon it. Faith without works is dead. And faith simply means we're trusting. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We're trusting what God has said in his word. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm saying that because you know what? I know I got a glorified body. I haven't seen it. I don't even know how it's going to work. Ain't too much at all I know about it, except I know I got it. It's coming. It's coming. When Jesus comes, he's going to change everything in the twinkling of an eye. And you say, well, uh, how do you know that? Because I'm trusting what the, temp what the Bible has said. Whatever the word of God has said, I'm trusting that it's true because he is true. That's great faith. That's great faith. And in your relationship with the Lord, the Lord will let you know what he's doing. And then you trust him to do what he says he's going to do. And sometimes God says no. There are times in my life I've been praying about something as hard as I could, believing as hard as I could. There was no doubt in me. And God said no. He said no. And then the idea is to trust him when he says no, trust and act accordingly. God's not going to do this. And that happens with, with most of us, my brothers and sisters. You know, uh, you hear a lot of stuff on, you watch a lot of stuff on TV. The picture is painted that if, if you just believe hard enough that uh, God is going to change your situation. So you got somebody sick, you got somebody sick now to death. And so in this case, what happened? Jesus went and he, he heals the centurion's a servant. But that doesn't always happen. That's rare. That's most of the time people die. And, the, and Hebrews tells us that they die in faith. We pray for people and they die in faith. And it's not because we didn't believe hard enough. It's because God said no, because he has a higher purpose. So I know folks are going to get mad when this, when this goes out on the airways. No, if you believe enough, you believe hard enough. See, the centurion servant got healed not because of the servant's faith. It was the centurion's faith. So if what you're telling me, that if I believe hard enough, why don't you believe hard enough to make it come true? 
Because uh, because it's just like the man that was let down uh, and he was on, on a pallet. They opened a hole in the roof. Jesus healed that man because of the faith of his friends, not, 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 his, not the man's faith himself. So you see, if that's what people are telling us is true, Marsha would be a lie. Because I put on a prayer list everywhere I went, and I'm a traveling man. <laughs> I remember Marcia got a little upset with me because I'm down in, in Georgia <laughs> and then South Carolina. And I'm telling folks, you know, because I'm always talking about Jesus. I'm telling folks, and uh, they said, oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, praise the Lord, so on and so forth. You know, that's, I love to talk about Jesus. Amen. Don't you love to talk about Jesus? Hey, yeah, amen. The more you talk about it, the more you love it. You get used to it. Jesus, 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 Jesus. What's your answer to that? Jesus. What's, Jesus. What's your answer to that? Jesus. What's your answer? Jesus. Man, something wrong with you. No, something wrong with you. <laughs> hey, ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm talking about Jesus. And so I, I, what happened was uh, I, we were checking out, and the lady, we found out we were Christians. There's a lady down. I've never seen this lady before in my life. And she talk, started talking about prayer. And I said, will you pray for my wife? And she said, your wife? Yeah. I said, right here. My wife's name is Marsha. And she's, we're dealing with cancer. And the lady said, look, I'm in a prayer. I'm in a prayer group all over South Carolina, North Carolina. I'm putting on the list now. She's going to get prayed for by everybody in the state that's, that's on this prayer list. So, uh, so I, what I'm saying was uh, Marsha was prayed for from all kinds of places. And I go further and say Tony Evans' wife was prayed for throughout the whole world. So in that situation, there got to be somebody who had enough faith so that my wife and Tony's wife would be healed. If what you're telling me is true. See, you see what I'm saying? Somebody in the whole world has got to have enough faith if that's all it takes. But God says no. And he took me to Hebrews 11.35 and he said, some didn't get the answer. Some were tortured. Some went through this. Some went through that. And so faith, great faith is responding to what God has told you. We okay now? Everybody, we're responsible to have great faith. But I'm here to tell you, God will go with you. Oh, he'll go with you. He'll walk with you and talk with you. He'll tell you you are his own. And the joy you share. Woo! Hallelujah. He'll walk with you. He'll be in your house with you. He'll be in your car with you. He'll be wherever you need him to be. He'll be there and let you know that you are with him and he is with you. Great faith is, is hearing what God has said and then acting on it. That's what God said? Okay, well, I'm cool. That's what I'm going to do. Next, you find sovereign compassion. Luke chapter 7, 11 through 17. Luke chapter 7, 11 through uh, 17. Now, where am I out of here? Okay, ministry. And it says in Luke uh, 7, 11. Now, it happened the day after. The day after. See, Jesus is healing every day. The day after, he went into a city called, we call it Nain. It's probably Nain. But a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him in a large crowd, 712. And it says, and when he came near the gate of the city, behold, behold means don't read too fast, slow it down, take a look. I want you to understand what's going on here. Behold, a dead man was being carried out. And it goes on and says, the only son of his mother, which means since they had no social security, they had no plan for anything like that, and she was a widow. So therefore, she would have no means of support, none whatsoever. And uh, the Bible says, and a large crowd from the city was with her. Now, verse 13, when the Lord saw her, and notice, we're going to focus on the word her. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on 
her and said to her, do not weep. See that, now this is sovereign compassion. The idea of compassion is, is that the Lord was acting out of the deep, the depth of his heart. He saw her. He had compassion on her. He said to her, now there were other folks, you know, there's a large crowd. All, he saw her. This is individual sovereign compassion and is put next to great faith. See, on the one hand, we're responsible to have great faith. But on the other hand, we realize when God blesses us, it's because of sovereign compassion. See, and so when you look at that, don't put her in there. Put your name in there. Jesus saw you. He had compassion on you. And he started talking to you. Stop weeping. This is individual. Jesus is not, a, not a, just a crowd with crowd with, uh, trying to please the crowd. Individual. And so in my life, I praise the Lord because I know Jesus saw me. The word saw is not just with the eyes. It means to perceive, to know, to understand. Jesus saw, knew, understood me. And if you say it today, my brothers and sisters, put your name in there. He understood, he saw, he recognized, he knew you. He had compassion on you. 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 Sovereign compassion. That's, and I always tell you my story about, about my brother Arnold. Uh, I, I don't care if I embarrass him because I know he loved me. You know, Arnold's a lovable guy. He loves me. And I just embarrass him anyway because I, I wasn't praying for Arnold. I was praying for one. Lord, give me one. I've been playing basketball down the wire for all these years. Just give me one. I said, I don't care who he is, Lord. Just give me one. I didn't know it was going to be Arnold. Sovereign compassion. God reached out and picked Arnold. You say, why? What was it about Arnold? It's about the Lord. Why did he pick me? It was about the Lord. Sovereign compassion. And, and, and out of the depths of his being, he saw us in our, in our condition. And just like the woman, he says, this woman has nobody. She only had one son. The son is dead. She's, she's going to be destitute. She's got nobody to take care of her. And he had compassion. Jesus saw me in my mess and ministered to me in my mess. Sovereign. You say, why did he choose me? Because he's sovereign. And I want you to understand this, that mercy and, so, and uh, sovereign compassion, there are no claims on that. Not, nobody, and we like to, you know, here's how we think, humanly speaking, we say, well, God, if you did that for them, you got to do that for me. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. You know the most beautiful creature that God ever created? When he messed up, God didn't save him. He didn't save him. He made no remedy to save him. Cut him out then. The most beautiful, intelligent, wise, the one who led worship, the, 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 the best created being. You see, he's, he was higher than Adam because we're lower than the angels. He didn't save him. God, I mean, God, you have, we can't put claims on God. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. He's sovereign. And when you understand that, and you, you, you praise him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, because you saw me. You saw me in my mess. You saw me in my misery. You saw me in uh, all that I was going through. You saw me, and you ministered to me. That's what's going on here. I mean, because listen, the man is dead. Could he have any faith? No, he's dead. 
could he do any could he do any any works? Say, well, look, if you just do this, I'll I'll heal you. And let me let me back up a little bit on this, um, and uh, which reminds me of what I uh, what I was going to say in verse four. Just real quick, they said that this sir that the centurion deserved having a healing on his servant because he was worthy. Do you know nobody's worthy? Nobody's worthy of a healing. God doesn't owe us to heal us. And, and what they said, they said, they said, Jesus, you see, he's, he loves us. He's built us a synagogue. He's done this. He's done that. You know, uh, there were some people who, who said about me uh, uh, when uh, I had some surgery, some different things. They said, well, surely God's going to bring Pastor Davis through. That's Pastor Davis. I said, that don't mean anything. That don't mean anything. You got to stop thinking like that. It, because... Uh, the many of us have gone through stuff. And the sovereign God loves us, and sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. But just because, and then what they were saying, he pastors a church, he does this, he does that. So surely God's going to heal him. Not so. Not so. I said, I don't know where you get that from. I mean, because I've known some, you know, the last few years, man, we start looking at folks who went on to be with the Lord, Man, I'm mean, all all my teachers, R.C. Sproul, uh, Warren Wearsby. You go on and on. Them brothers are gone. So how do you think I'm gonna stay? <laughs> it's not about we deserve. It's the grace of God, sovereign mercy, and so uh, Jesus. Then uh, here's a here's a person he looks at. And he does something to help her in her situation. The Bible says in verses 16 and 17 of Luke chapter 7, it says, And there came fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God has visited his people. Yeah. See, now they got some things correct, but not everything. That's why when you hear people testify, you got to understand they may be telling some things that are true, but there's not, sometimes there's doctrinal unsoundness. And so if you look at here uh, and what is said uh, in verse 16 and, and verse 17, it said that a great prophet is risen. Jesus is more than a prophet, man. You see what I'm saying? And so what they were saying they had a testimony, and so when you hear testimonies in churches, you, you listen and you understand, you give God the glory, but a lot of times what people are saying is not true. true. It's true according to their experience, but it may not be doctrinally sound all the way through. That's what I'm trying to say. Jesus is not just a prophet. He's not one of the prophets. He's the son. And, but that was the testimony. But they had a fear and a reverence and, uh, of the Lord because of what God had done, what Jesus had done. Now, they, re they recognized that uh, God had visited them. You see that in uh, he had visited his people. The idea of visitation is the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And if, if we got a couple of scriptures, I'm going I'm to have uh, my sister put them up on the screen. Luke chapter 1, verse 68. If it's coming up, Luke chapter 1 and verse 68, it says, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited. See that word? Visited. All right, let's go to another scripture. Look at Luke 1, 78. Through the tender mercy of our God, which the day spring on high has visited us. Go to another scripture, Luke 19, 44. Now, G Jesus is talking to Jerusalem. He says, I'm going to level you and your children within you. I'm going to level you to the ground because, and they will not leave in you. Talking about Jerusalem and the temple. He's talking about the temple. You see, folks love the temple. You know, going back to Jeremiah's day, they would recite the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is this. You know, it's kind of like you uh, having vain repetitions. 
you don't have a relationship, so you come up with vain repetition. And so they, they, had a, they didn't have a relationship in Jeremiah's time. They didn't have a relationship in Jesus' time, but they kept pointing. See that temple? That means we're all right. We're all right because of that temple. And Jesus addressed the temple. We're actually addressing them. He said, I'm going to level you and your children within you. I'm going to level you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. See, the word visitation means when God is moving in our lives, whether individually or as a body of believers or as a nation, a group of people, God is moving by his spirit and people, some folks are getting it and others are not. And what the Lord is saying, you're missing the time of your visitation. Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. All that he did was the time of God's visitation upon them through the ministry of Jesus, and they missed it. Jesus said, the publicans and sinners are coming in, but the Pharisees and Sadducees, you miss it. You're missing the time of God's visitation. See, that happens, that happens a lot. It happens Sunday after Sunday. It happens when we witness to people. Some people take heed and others miss. Others say, well, no, nah, i hear you later. I don't want to hear it right now. They miss the time. God is visiting them with the Holy Spirit to save them, to deliver them, and people reject it and turn it down. And the Bible says that's the time of your visitation. And the problem with that, with turning it down, is God may never give you another visit. He may not visit again. And if he doesn't visit, you can't get saved. It doesn't matter what you know. And you see what happened to the nation of Israel? They missed the time of the, of the visitation, and as a result, they went into captivity. Uh, and in 70 AD, they were destroyed. The nation was destroyed. Let's go to the confirmed assurance. I'm going to be here long on this one, 17, 7, 18 through 23, Luke chapter 7. So what we're looking at in Luke chapter 7, uh, we're looking at great faith, sovereign compassion, confirmed assurance. Now what happens is John is trying to figure out really what's going on. And if I look at uh, verse 21, Luke 7, 21. You can read the rest on your own. It says, and in that same hour, Jesus, he cured, as Jesus, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Now, verse 22, then Jesus answered and said to them, go your way and tell John what things you have seen and, and heard. So what Jesus is saying the scriptures in the Old Testament through Isaiah and other places said when the Messiah came, these are the things he would do. So instead of Jesus just saying, yes, I'm the Messiah, he said, go tell John the word of God is being fulfilled. See, that's how we know truth. That is how we know truth. The word of God is being fulfilled. The Bible is true. So the reason we know that this Bible is true because of fulfilled prophecy. It was over 100-something prophecies at Jesus' first coming. All the prophecies that, that were fulfilled means that this has to be the word of God. It's impossible for all this to be fulfilled. 700 years before Jesus was born, uh, Isaiah told King Ahaz that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And his name is going to be Emmanuel. And, and it was confirmed in the, in, in the next couple years to the King Ahaz. And then 700 years later, just as Jesus said, I mean, just as Isaiah said. So what we have is confirmed assurance through the word of God. So, that, and so that's how you know what's true and what's not true. It's the word of God. The word of God is true. The word of God is always true. Great faith, sovereign compassion, co confirmed assurance. And now in verses uh, 36 through 50, and we're going to look just at a couple of verses, abundant love, abundant love. 
And that reminds me of the Bee Gees. How deep is your love? How deep is your love? How deep is your love today? Look, look at verses um, 47 and 48. 47 and 48. And it says, Wherefore I say unto you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. How deep is my love? You see, if I really understand how much I've been forgiven, then I'm going to love deeply. That's the idea. See, the Pharisee who invited Jesus, he thought he was, oh, he thought he was good enough. He, th he felt because he was a Pharisee, he was going to heaven. He didn't need to be forgiven. He's forgiven because of the things that he did. And so he didn't love Jesus. And what Jesus says to the woman who came in, and uh, the Bible will say that uh, what she did, that, uh, let me see, uh, what did, uh, she, uh, she stood at his feet, Weeping, she washed his feet with tears, and she wiped her, uh, them with the hairs of her head, kissed his feet, anointed them with oil. And when the Pharisee saw that, he spoke within himself. He said, man, if, Jesus, if, he, if he's a prophet, he should know what kind of woman this is. See, his, his mind was all messed up. He felt that the Lord Jesus, if he's a great man, he wouldn't allow these kind of people to touch him. But this Pharisee was the worst sinner than all. Jesus said to them, woe to you Pharisees, woe to you lawyers. To the publicans and sinners, which you, you think they're the worst sinners, but they're getting saved. You not. So you got the key of knowledge, and you won't use it yourself, and you prevent other people from uh, opening the door so they can get the knowledge. The wickedness of self-righteousness. So the question comes, Jesus says, the one who loves much is forgiven much. Excuse me, the one who is forgiven much, rather. I'm, I had it backwards. The one who's forgiven much loves much. You see what I'm, what I'm saying? See, all of us have been forgiven much. But the more we understand it, the more we love Jesus. So your love gets deeper when you realize how much we've been forgiven how much Jesus Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. The, uh, if righteousness came by the law, Jesus died in vain. But his death is the reason why all of us who are saved are saved. He is the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means satisfaction. Satisfaction. I'm going I'm to embarrass my granddaughter. <laughs> she and I were looking at a, at a deal last year. No one going into great detail. And I said, I love you, my granddaughter. I'm glad to help you. And so uh, I had to fill out some papers and some blah, blah, this and that. And she was satisfied. I was satisfied. But the agency was not satisfied. So she said, Grandpa, and she didn't want to say this to me, but Grandpa, she said, you got to do more. You got to sign for more. They want you to do this and that. And I ain't doing that. <laughs> so, I mean, they got in, you know, they sent me a letter and all this and, and all I'm reading and they're telling me, I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing them. Yeah, yeah, you satisfied? Your granddaughter satisfied? But we the ones who are, who are operating this system, we're op and we ain't satisfied. And so the point is, is that they wouldn't uh, budge at all. They had to be satisfied. And what we say uh, in satisfaction and we talk about propitiation, God the Father had to be satisfied. The death of bulls and goats can't satisfy God. Works wouldn't satisfy God. 
all the pledges that we didn't satisfy God. And uh, I said, and I'm talking to people, I've witnessed the people, and they said, well, I'm satisfied. I think I've done enough for God. I'm, I said, yeah, you satisfied. And you say, and Jesus, I know he loves me. I say, yeah, well, okay, I, I'm going to grant you that. Jesus loves you. So I think he's satisfied. Well, what about God the Father? Well, the Father ought to be, no, the Father ain't satisfied. See, in order to vindicate and satisfy the Father, you got to bring the blood of Jesus. If you don't bring the blood of Jesus, God ain't moving. And he ain't budging. <laughs> there ain't no other, uh, uh, there's no other agreement, no other contract, no other discussion. It's, it's done. Unless you come with the blood of Jesus, God is not satisfied. Praise his heavenly and holy name. As I conclude today, there's a story about uh, the virgins, the uh, foolish and wise virgins. But when I think about the sins being forgiven and what Jesus was saying, we're talking about the uh, confirmation, confirmed assurance, abundant love. First of all, great faith, sovereign compassion, confirmed assurance, and abundant love. Okay? So how deep is your love? And the question follows that is, well, what you going to do with Jesus? What you going to do with Jesus? What you going to do? Let me back up to Luke 7, 28 and 30 through 35, and I'll, I'll be done here. Luke chapter 7 and verse uh, 28. Luke 7, 28. And it says here, Jesus says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God, get that, the kingdom of God, is greater than he. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. In other words, to justify God meant they got baptized because they said this message is true, which, de which they were declaring this is the right thing. I'm a sinner. I need to get ready for God, and God's going to send his son, and the kingdom is coming. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to identify with the message and the messenger. So they got baptized, which meant that they justified God. You with me? They're justified. They're saying that God is, that God is right. So the Bible goes on to say, uh, but the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized. And what we're saying today, see, we've justified the message of Jesus Christ by getting saved. We surrender. But those who reject Jesus Christ and refuse to get saved, what they're doing, instead of justifying the message of God, they're rejecting the message of God. And so the Bible says that Jesus said, and the Lord said, where unto then, where, where excuse me, where unto then, shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? He says, they're like children sitting in the marketplace, in the marketplace and calling one to another saying, we have piped to you and you have not danced. We have mourned to you and you have not wept. He said, let me explain what I mean. The very next verse. He said, for John the Baptist came eating, and, eating bread and uh, came, excuse me, neither eating bread nor drinking wine. You say he is demon-possessed. John was out. He didn't get involved with the crowd. He stayed away. You say something wrong with him. He said the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And you say he's a gluttonous man. He's a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans. And then he says in verse 35, wisdom is justified of all her children. Justified or vindicated. Here's the idea. You go back to verse 29. Everyone who receives the word of God, surrenders to the word of God, is declaring that God is right, and they are vindicated by their lifestyle. They live for Jesus Christ. Wisdom is justified, and I like to say it this way. Wisdom is justified by, uh, by all her children. So look at, the, uh, look at the results. Look at the offspring. When you act like a fool, what happens? You got foolish results. 
You don't get wisdom. And so I say to people, you know, when people come to they say, well, you just too strict. You just coming with the word of God. It's got to be, you got to give me some leeway. Well, how's it working for you? And I've told you the story about this, this guy. Uh, and every Christmas time, we used to get a bonus. Man, we get a bonus at, at GM. And, uh, and the guy was talking to me. He'd he been telling me. He said, uh, man, he said, you a Christian. I said, yeah. He said, I, won't, I wouldn't be a Christian. He said, do you know how much fun you're missing out on? He said, don't you see all these women in, these, in this plant? He said, man, he said, you could have you two or three of them women. You could be doing this and that and that. Nah, man, I ain't going there. I ain't doing that. He said, that's why I'm not going to be a Christian because you're not having fun. You see all the fun I'm having? Come Christmas time, I looked at my bonus. He came by, and he was using uh, the F word as much as he could. He was, he was coming with it. <laughs> man, what's wrong with you? What's wrong, man? You all right? My wife, my ex-wife got all my bonus. <laughs> How'd that happen? I was behind in alimony. I said, oh, wisdom <laughs> is justified. I said, you see this? I'm going home and get this to my wife. Wisdom is justified by all her children. You ain't, he had a receipt there, you know. Uh, you know. <laughs> he, had a, he had a stub. X amount of money, no check. <laughs> so, so Jesus said, you're living without me. How's it working for you? How's it working for you? You look around at somebody and, and husband and wife together, building a family, uh, doing their best, best to serve the Lord. You got all kind of stuff hitting you day by day. You, and, and you can't work it out. You know what? It takes great faith. It takes our God who's a, a sovereign uh, compassion on us. And God is ready to have sovereign compassion on everyone here. Then there's confirmed assurance because the word of God will tell you that you're, that you're living right. And then the more you realize that there's abundant love. I love the Lord. You love the Lord more today than yesterday. But not as much as tomorrow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So what you going to do with Jesus? What you going to do with him? What you gonna, don't reject him because wisdom is justified by all her children. Let me pray for you. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for uh, your word in Luke chapter 7. We see, the devil don't want me to pray, huh? All right, we're going to see something here. All right. Just going to take it off my... All right. Let's, let's go. Father, thank you. Thank you for what we've experienced already. Thank you, Lord, for your word out of Luke 7, where we see our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see him healing. We see him raising the dead. We see him confirming John. And uh, then we see this woman who loved him so much because she realized how much she was forgiven. That's our prayer, Father, that all of us here, that we would understand it's our responsibility to develop great faith. Help us, Father, to develop great faith. In other words, when we hear you speaking to us, when we read it in your word, Father, help us to respond and act on it the way we're supposed to. Give us that wherewithal from the Holy Spirit because we can't do it without you. Next, Father, we bow in submission to your sovereign compassion because you have been compassionate on all of us. The Psalm 103 says this about your compassion that uh, you realize that we're just uh, dust. You know, understand our frame. And as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on them that love him. Thank you for your compassion in our lives. We are where we are because of you. We would have been dead and gone. We would have been already in the lake of fire, or excuse me, uh, in hell fire with the rich man. But Lord, you delivered us. As Brother Fletcher would say, I should have been dead and gone, 
but the Lord let me linger on. Thank you, Father. Thank you. And then, Lord, uh, thank you for the assurance that when we start to doubt, when things aren't going right, Father, we ask that you would uh, cause us to remember the word of the living God. As we go to the uh, word, search it and pray it. And like Psalms 1, help us to meditate on that word day and night because we will become like trees planted by the rivers of water who will bring forth fruit in the due season. And then, Father, deepen our love. Deepen our love because of who you are and how you work in our lives. So, Father, we give you the praise, the honor, the glory. You are awesome, God. And as we're deciding now what to do with Jesus, help us to decide that we're going to receive him, not to reject him, because we understand wisdom is vindicated. Wisdom is justified by all her children. Thank you, Father, for this time. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to ask of our ushers to please take their places. We're going to make ready to receive our offering unto the Lord today. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, 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 there's just something about the name. You are the master, savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Oh, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. Deacon Arnold's going to listen to the word of prayer. Amen. Amen. Master, Savior, precious Jesus. Let all heaven, heaven and earth proclaim Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yes, thank you, Lord. Heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something about that name. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. 